Well, dear Deb, uh, as you said your last words, I try to think what ties, what is the link between politics, academia, and theater. And uh, I think the link is a Greek word for acting, which is ethopios, which has ethos as its root. And ethos is all our moral values. And I think that's what links the three areas uh, that I was involved. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, allow me before I start my speech to say it's a great honor for me to be here today to celebrate CPD's 20th anniversary. And I would like, first of all, to congratulate Professor Soban for his vision and leadership in setting up the Institute. And also, I would like to congratulate Dr. Rahman for steering the CPD's work. I would like to congratulate all of CPD's staff for their accomplishments over the years and for teaching us so much about Bangladesh, about development, and about public dialogue and what public dialogue should be all about. And a special thanks goes to my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Deb Bhattacharya, for teaching me a lot, for sharing his wisdom, his knowledge, and his insights on politics, policy, and development. I hope that despite differences, you find some of these ideas expressed here interesting and relevant to Bangladesh as you try to promote sustainable and inclusive development in a fiscally constrained environment. Trying to promote sustainable and inclusive development in a fiscally envi constrained environment. Is the task feasible? What needs to be avoided? What can be done? I will draw evidence mainly from my own country, Greece, not only because uh, I know it better and it found itself at the epicenter of this financial crisis, but because it continues to face three policy challenges which are similar to those of most developing countries, let alone emerging economies. How to promote growth, investment, employment creation, and social inclusion in the context of severe fiscal constraints and high public and private debt? How to combat high unemployment rates, increasing poverty and inequality, under limited degrees of freedom for national government spending and for expanding the tax base. Last but not least, how to improve governance and uphold democratic institutions and processes in the context of growing political segmentation and lack of confidence in the capacity of national governments to initiate change. I will try to answer these questions and highlight their implications for global and national policy making. First, by commenting on the nature and characteristics of the European crisis from a global perspective. Then by examining and evaluating the manner in which the crisis was handled and managed by the IMF, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank, the so-called Troika and then draw policy implications which could be helpful in guiding our steps forward. Finally, I will conclude with some thoughts on what could constitute a sustainable transformative agenda for the world economy and our countries, and I hope that during the question and answer period we can move forward and we can discuss some of these lessons. Let me start, therefore, with the European crisis in a global perspective. The crisis in Greece erupted when, towards the end of 2009, the country's access to international financial markets was put into question due to rapidly rising spreads for Greek bonds. In less than five months, it evolved into a full-fledged sovereign solvency crisis. By April 2010, 
Greek government debt was downgraded to junk bond status, and private capital markets were no longer available for Greece as a funding source. Markets simply closed down. On May 2, 2010, following the hasty creation of the European Financial Stability Fund, the Eurozone countries and the IMF agreed on a 110 billion euro bailout loan for Greece, conditional on the implementation of austerity measures, privatization of government assets worth 50 billion euros, and introduction of structural reforms to improve competitiveness. According to existing evidence today, which comes out of actually a lot of studies that have been done in the United States, fund managers had started taking open positions against a possible Greek default as early as 2007, while also covering themselves against potential losses via purchases of credit default swaps, namely in insurance schemes against potential default. While everyone was aware of the serious fiscal and external imbalances of the Greek economy, as well as the need of adjustment, neither the newly elected government nor the European Commission, the European Central Bank, or even major international banks had predicted, let alone prepared for the crisis. Throughout the fall term of 2009, banks were busy to prepare the placement of Greek bonds in international capital markets, and the Greek government, including myself, to prepare a medium-term plan to be submitted in January to the European Commission under the usual Growth and Stability Pact obligations. All parties were working under the assumption that there was time and opportunity for gradual adjustment to redress the imbalances at hand. If anything, the government had been elected a few months earlier with a clear 44% majority to address exactly these challenges, as well as to improve governance and wipe out corruption that had brought down the previous government. Markets, however, had a different opinion. The speculative attack against the Greek bonds, and indirectly the euro itself, triggered, and this is interesting, by the downgrading of ratings for Greek bonds in mid-December 2009, exactly within a week by Fitch, Moody's, and Standard & Poor, brought the Greek government to its knees and the Eurozone to the brink of collapse. So the first lesson to be drawn from the Greek crisis is that concerted action by few financial speculators can produce an unprecedented crisis for a national government. This is not a new lesson for Southeast Asia, which experienced the grave consequences of a financial crisis at the end of the 90s. The characteristics of the Asian crisis are strikingly similar to the Eurozone one 10 years later. Already by the first half of the 90s, in East and Southeast Asia, foreign portfolio investment attracted by favorable investment opportunities had risen rapidly. Assets of international banks accumulated, attracted by large interest rate differentials. Banks in the region made short-term loans in international markets to finance the investment needs of domestic firms, thereby increasing their exposure to foreign exchange and maturity risks. At the same time, Given high liquidity and high expected returns, financial institutions increase their lending to domestic firms and to non-tradable activities, including real estate, financial services, and infrastructure investment, some of which had low productivity. As a result, financial and corporate institutions in those countries became extremely vulnerable to a s slowdown in short-term capital flows, which, when they occurred, brought the economies to their knees. At that time, the UN's Committee for Development Policy, of which I was a member, issued a report warning against the danger of successive financial crises. It was 1998. If the global, and it was saying that these financial crises would continue to occur, if the global financial system continued to be left without adequate oversight and proper regulation. East Asian countries learned their lesson the hard way. 
they started building their own reserves and adopted a proactive transformational agenda through active trade and investment policies. For many European countries, including my own, joining the Eurozone was considered to be a sufficient condition to hide vulnerabilities and risks and piggyback on the strength of the German economy. We were able to do so for seven years, borrowing in international markets and extremely low interest rates to finance consumption, real estate and financial services, much as the Asian countries had done in the 90s. The international community did not, I'm afraid, learn any lesson either. In that same 1998 report, CDP called for the creation of a world financial organization. We called it a WFO. To provide overall guidance in the development and monitoring of international standards and codes of conduct for private financial management and capital flows, and to identify new needs for supervision of private capital markets in particular as they arise. We argued then that the WFO was needed to curb destructive competition and inconsistency in national regulatory frameworks and to review, establish and monitor sound international principles, practices and standards in such areas as accounting, payments and settlements, financial supervision, the functioning of credit rating agencies as well as the establishment and operation of international bankruptcy regimes. A WFO could also devise, in cooperation with other public and private institutions, acceptable forms for regulating short-term capital movements to complement national measures and to monitor the application of international guidelines for short-term lending and borrowing by private creditors and borrowers. These recommendations were never seriously considered. Instead, a year later, the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1999 encouraged financial institutions to engage freely in investment and speculative activities alongside with commercial ones and incentivized them to minimize risks via securitization of loans and credit default swaps. They proceeded to set up unregistered and unregulated offshore hedge funds, promote derivative trading, and develop complicated financial products and instruments so as to bypass transparency and or capitalization requirements imposed by national regulating authorities. Deregulation and capital market liberalization in the absence of proper incentives for prudent lending or investment facilitated the buildup of risky assets in global financial institutions portfolios. Globalization led to a concentration of world savings and resources in the hands of few. In a path-breaking study, which is not widely quoted, entitled The Network of Global Corporate Control, published in October 2012, the Swiss Federal Institute analyzed a database of 37 million corporations and investors. It found out that through close interconnections between the world's largest corporations, a small consortium of 147 corporations, most of which are banks, form a super entity which has control over 40% of the world's wealth. Barclays, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase, UBS, Deutsche Bank, Bank of New York, Mellon, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, and Societe Generale figure prominently in this group. The control of potent financial interests over the global allocation of resources has had, dear friends, profound implications both for financial stability and domestic policy making. As connections to controlling groups are networked across the world, Contagion risks are exacerbated while financial institutions are becoming too big to fail. At the same time, a dramatic shift of political power towards financial capital has taken place in almost all countries. The solvency of sovereign governments and enterprises 
as well as their access to liquidity and credit provision, rest almost exclusively in the hands of financial institutions. They determine to a large extent the capacity of governments to cover imbalances, refinance debt, and provide needed liquidity to the real economy. They refinance or restructure loans at their discretion without having to abide by specific rules or to disclose the criteria or the terms guiding their operations. For example, only four out of Europe's ten biggest banks, ranked by assets, disclose information on the amount and the terms of renegotiated loans. As financial institutions are becoming the dominant players, both at the national and global levels, their interests shape the conduct of policymaking. As governments succumb by fear, choice, or even capture to pressures from the financial sector, non-financial enterprises, especially the small ones, as well as wage earners, taxpayers, pensioners, or the young, progressively lose voice and political representation in influencing policymaking. Policymaking, therefore, especially in times of crisis, is shaped increasingly so by the interests of a global financial system which in the absence of regulation, appropriate incentives or effective oversight caters to its narrow financial interests as opposed to the national interests. This is the second lesson to be drawn from the Eurozone crisis. In responding to the crisis, and let me come to the second section of my talk, the ECB and European policymakers downplayed the systemic characteristics of a Eurozone-wide debt or solvency crisis, as well as the risks generated by the accumulation of toxic assets in the European banking system, and focused exclusively on the fiscal and structural imbalances of individual member states. In the Greek case, they chose, by accident, to question, not to intervene in the Greek sovereign bond market to stop the speculative attack and dismiss the possibility of a Greek debt restructuring early on. They chose not to restructure the debt as such a move would have entailed losses for large European banks, which not only held that debt, but had also sold insurance against default in the form of credit default swaps. No bail-in clauses were considered or applied to large European banks as they've been done in Cyprus, which proceeded over the next two years to restructure their portfolios by divesting 130 billion euro worth of Greek sovereign bonds. So over the two years, while no restructuring was taking place, European banks were divesting Greek bonds. When restructuring could no longer be postponed, private investors agreed a voluntary 50% haircut in converting their existing bonds into new loans. This was accompanied by additional compensatory financing for the banking system through massive recapitalizations of banks paid by taxpayers' money. The same thing actually happens often in our own countries. Non-performing loans are covered through recapitalizations or restructuring paid by taxpayers' money. While it's interesting, clientelistic relationships develop between the financial system, powerful corporate entities, and the governments. And this has been our experience. Now, no corresponding compensatory provisions were made for individual sovereign bondholders or public entities, universities, hospitals, chambers of commerce, whose assets were halved overnight due to the 50% haircut imposed. And no provision has been made so far for liquidity to be channeled to a credit-thirsty real sector. Thus, European policymakers chose to focus their collective efforts on protecting creditors and the banking system at the expense of European productive enterprises. Large European banks managed not only to avoid paying the cost of past dubious lending practices or toxic derivatives, 
but were compensated, and according to some estimates, the subsidies re received were to the, of the order of 234 billion euros. The burden from income losses and the size of the transfers to the banking system have been excessive in the case of Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Cyprus, as these member states were forced to adopt austerity policies in exchange for financial support from the EFSF and the subsequent European support mechanism, the ESM. Nowhere was the loss of income and employment more dramatic than in the case of Greece. Allow me to say a few things about the Greek experience and then draw the lessons from that. Between 2010 and 2013, Greece ended up borrowing from official creditors 219 billion euros. 219 billion euros. The interesting thing is that more than 97% of this funding has been used to pay back interest and amortization payments, cash obligations against the PSI, or to cover the recapitalization needs of banks. Less than 8 billion euros have been used to support pressing domestic budget needs or to channel liquidity to a starving market. So we borrowed 219 billion to repay creditors. Sharp reductions in fiscal expenditures, such as drastic reductions in public sector wages and pensions, cuts in public investment and social expenditure, coupled with exorbitant increases in excise, VAT, and property taxes, have plunged the economy into a deep recession which has lasted for seven years. Many of the so-called structural reforms have been fiscal measures in disguise. Most of the labor market reforms, including the dismantling of collective agreements and of the minimum wage, have had further depressing effects on economic activity. Cuts in social protection benefits have reduced productivity. At the same time, much needed regulatory governance or legal system reforms have not been implemented. Well, what have been the results? According to the IMF's own evaluation, the ensuing recession has been much stronger and lasting than projected. Real GDP today in Greece is 25% lower than in 2007. 25% lower than in 2007 compared to an expected 5.5% decline. Unemployment has exceeded 26% compared to the original 15% envisaged. Public debt has increased from about 120% to 175% as a fraction of GDP. The target rate was 124%. As the underlying debt dynamics are worsening and growth prospects remain uncertain, private investment over GDP has fallen by over 10 percentage points and high unemployment, reduced incomes, and increased uncertainty have contributed to high levels of undeclared work, increased tax evasion, non-performing loans, and unpaid social security contributions. To the notable economic failures of the program, one needs to add the extreme social costs incurred for large segments of the Greek population and the dangerous political repercussions of the policies pursued. In Greece, as in other southern European countries, and I wanted to say a few words about the political repercussions of these policies, austerity policies have eroded public confidence in the capacity of national governments, traditional political parties, and European institutions to safeguard decent livelihoods. It has brought about political instability, social polarization, xenophobia, and rising Euroscepticism. According to a recent Ipsos opinion poll, three out of four Europeans believe that the economic crisis will worsen in their own country and that European institutions are incapable of reversing the trend or narrow the growing divide between member countries. Europe, and not only Greece, is becoming rapidly segmented polarized and weaker as a global actor. One cannot explain the results 
of the recent Euro elections unless one understands what the impact of these policies have done for public confidence in the capacity of governments to manage their economy and to safeguard decent livelihoods. Seven years after the eruption of this crisis, economic activity is practically stagnant in Europe with the unemployment rate of in the Euro 28 exceeding 11%. Unemployment is a nightmare for 60% of the European population according to a recent poll. It is in this rapidly deteriorating economic, political and social context that we need to revisit and evaluate the underlying principles behind the actions and decisions made and draw the relevant lessons. I'm deeply convinced that these do not pertain only to Europe, but also to many other developing countries, including your own. What do we learn from these mistakes? What are the lessons for the future? The IMF, in its 2012 evaluation of the program, actually it's interesting that the IMF is doing an evaluation, the European Commission or the Central Bank has not done an evaluation so far, attributes its failure to three main factors. The underestimation of fiscal multipliers, the ineffectiveness of structural reforms to boost private investment, and the decision by authorities to rule out debt restructuring at the onset of the program. All three factors, in my view, do not address the fundamental problem with the program's design and objective, namely to support at all costs the banking system itself and to extract through internal devaluations a sizable surplus to be transferred to creditors. The creation of an escrow deposit account at the Bank of Greece where all funds from the primary budget surplus or from privatizations need to be deposited to service future debt payments provide sufficient testimony to the underlying objective of the program. So do unacceptable legal provisions embedded in the loan agreements that in the case of inability to pay, creditors can seize national public assets based on a decision by the Luxembourg Court of Justice, including the gold held by the central bank. This was actually, Deb, the reason for, the fundamental reason for 21 parliament members, including myself, not to vote for that agreement. That creditors, if there is an inability to pay even of one tranche, creditors can seize all assets, including the gold of the Bank of Greece. What was in fact attempted was a massive forced redistribution of resources from the real economies and taxpayers of the Eurozone to private and official creditors. This massive redistribution has in fact backfired. The capacity of debtors to service their obligations is rapidly deteriorating. Non-performing loans and debt obligations are rising and European policymakers are trying to find politically acceptable ways to shift gears and resume investment and growth. Secular stagnation in Europe, therefore, is not the outcome of the crisis itself, but of the way the crisis has been handled. Austerity policies guided by the overarching objective of policymakers to support at all costs the European financial system as opposed to its real economies have brought Europe to an impasse. This is the third important lesson to be learned. Unless these policies are reversed the soonest possible, there is a great risk that the Eurozone will crumble, the European project will be discredited and stalled, and Europe will be severely weakened as a global power. Now, useful lessons can also be drawn with regard to fiscal, monetary, and labor market policy effectiveness, which can provide insights for the future. The first lesson is that the primacy of fiscal goals as the backbone of a policy strategy that aimed to improve financial stability, competitiveness and growth turned out to be self-defeating. Deep expenditure cuts and tax increases 
have led economies into a deeper than expected recession and an austerity trap. Despite concerted efforts to discredit them, Keynesian economics have been proven valid once again. Fiscal policy is an effective tool both to reduce as well as to spur demand, much more than quantitative easing and monetary policy is, which is relatively ineffective when the economy is in stagnation. So fiscal policy works, austerity policies dampen demand a lot. Second lesson, in the absence of exchange rate adjustment, the combination of a major credit crunch resulting from deleveraging of the banking sector and internal devaluation policies tend to result in a dramatic reduction in of aggregate demand. If on top of fiscal policy you have a liquidity crunch, this is even worse. You have firm closures and a massive surge in unemployment. Now, improving bank solvency and recapitalization, giving back the money to the banks, does not guarantee liquidity provision to the real economy. Does not mean that recapitalizing the banks, this would help the real economy. This needs to be secured and it needs policy action to bypass sometimes the banking system via special provisions and instruments that in essence, as I said, bypass the banking sector, especially in times of financial crisis. And this is, I think, a, is a lesson for many countries which see their financial sector having non-performing loans. Third, despite the sharp reduction in wages in both the public and private sectors and major labor market reforms to enhance flexibility of the labor market, the improvement in final price competitiveness in almost all vulnerable countries has been minimal. So we slashed wages but did not affect final price competitiveness. As taxes, energy prices and social security contributions have not adjusted concomitantly while productivity has dropped. In the case of Greece, actually price competitiveness has deteriorated. The sizable improvement in the trade and current account balance, which has been highlighted as proof of the program's success, is a result of a sharp drop in import demand as opposed to improvements in price or structural competitiveness. Fourth, despite these major labor market reforms, we saw sharp increases in unemployment, particularly among the young. In fact, these massive horizontal reductions in wages and remunerations, often espoused by the IMF and actually espoused by the Troika, coupled with the replacement of full employment contracts by temporary and intermittent work contracts, have reduced purchasing power, aggravated the recessionary impact of the fiscal cuts, caused many SMEs to close, and contributed to rising as opposed to falling unemployment. Last but not least, the deterioration of living standard has undermined the credibility of governments to manage the economy. And as I said, according to a recent Eurobarometer, only 31% of respondents say that they trust European institutions today as opposed to 47% in 2008. And more alarming is the fact that 66% of respondents declare that the citizen's voice does not count. Well, in view of the failure of this program and its consequences, the question remains, are there degrees of freedom available to map a different course of transformational agenda that is compatible with growth, employment, decent livelihoods, and social inclusion? My answer to this question is yes. That's why I'm in politics and in policy. Subject, however, to an important precondition, that there exists suitable leadership with a vision and the independence to pursue a sustainable transformative agenda and reach political settlements conducive to support it. After my experiences, dear friends, I've come to say that politics matter more than economics. 
History is full of such examples. Men and women who have exercised leadership and changed the course of history by reforming their communities, enterprises, or countries, by initiating change, and by serving the public interest. Change is needed both at the global and the national levels. Leadership matters, and the quality of leadership matters, and the independence of leadership matters. It is clear from my narrative on the Greek crisis that the degrees of freedom available to any single government depend on the global political and economic environment that it operates in. Allow me to say a few thoughts on suggestions for policy revisions at the global level and then move to the national level. The first lesson is that the present global financial system is clearly not fit for purpose. Financial crises such as the one that hit both the US, Europe or East Asia in the past will continue to occur as long as commercial and investment activities of, gl of global financial institutions are not kept separate, are not kept apart. And so long as there are no clear rules of conduct, standards, or effective oversight to mitigate collusive practices, speculative attacks, or manipulation of currency and interest rates. That's why we should all join forces to push for a major reform agenda in this area. Given the reluctance and difficulties to create now a WFO, a World Financial Organization, as proposed by the CDP in the 90s, a first step could be the creation of a Global Council on Sustainable Development Finance as a UN or G20 initiative. The purpose of such initiative could be to engage the financial sector in an open debate with other global social partners and stakeholders on how to improve information sharing, transparency and accountability, how to promote financial stability, and how to facilitate the provision of long-term finance, trade finance, and SME financing for countries at different levels of development, including Bangladesh. The Addis 2015 forthcoming conference on financing for development provides an opportunity for progress in that direction. Our collective global efforts should also focus on revisiting both sovereign and private debt restructuring procedures and mechanisms. It is highly likely that other countries will find themselves in the place of Greece or Argentina and more banks or enterprises, some too big to fail, will need to have their debt restructured. The inertia that has characterized the European response to over-indebtedness has been one of the major causes behind European stagnation and has exacerbated the social cost of the crisis. Five years after the eruption of the crisis, it is clear that the Greek debt today needs to be restructured if Greece is to move forward. We need to agree on how to do it best in a transparent way, sharing costs and benefits between creditors and borrowers and between generations as equitably as possible and avoiding moral hazard. Creating debt redemption funds or equitizing excessive debt might be one promising solution. There might be others. There is a pressing need, however, to address collectively this challenge and this is important both at the global level and at the national level. How do you do the restructuring? Our third major global collective effort should concern the fight against tax avoidance and tax havens. According to a recent study, based on an analysis of foreigners' banks' holdings released by central banks in Switzerland and Luxembourg, approximately $7.6 trillion i.e. 8% of the world's personal financial wealth is stashed in tax havens. According to that author, Zuckman, if all this illegally hidden money were properly recorded and taxed, global tax revenues would increase by more than $200 billion a year. These numbers do not include corporate tax avoidance, which has become so widespread that from the late 1980s until now, 
the effective corporate tax rate in the United States has dropped from 30% to 15%, even though the tax rate has not changed. Let us therefore raise our collective voices and support initiatives and efforts to promote transparency and cross-country information sharing, the abolition of tax havens, and the promotion of stringent rules and regulations against bank secrecy and or transfer pricing. And this holds for Bangladesh, as well as for Greece, as well as for all the countries. In the presence of globalized markets, productivity growth and competitiveness enhancing measures should be at the core of any transformational agenda, not fiscal consolidation. European competitiveness cannot be enhanced on the basis of drastic wage reductions or by internal devaluations, slashing pensions by 70% or wages by 40%. Developing countries, including Bangladesh, and even many emerging economies, are in a much better position to reap low labor cost competitive advantages. Europe's competitiveness can only be enhanced via investments in R&D, intensive products and services, human capital, innovation, infrastructure, and high quality business and social services, both public and private. This would make Europe much better and able to attract global enterprises, export higher value added products and services, and provide higher quality jobs. Each country needs to have a vision for its future and a transformative strategy for its implementation, shaped by its history, endowments and culture. Fiscal consolidation or repayment of debt does not constitute a vision or a strategy for this future. At best, it is a means, a necessary means towards an end. Shaping, therefore, and implementing a transformative strategy for the future is a must, both for Greece and for Bangladesh. It focuses on how to promote structural change and productivity enhancing reforms, to upgrade the productive base, develop new sectors, products and services, and invest on powerful enablers such as governance, infrastructure, human capital, technology, and local, regional, and global networks. The European experience so far has demonstrated that creating an enabling environment through regulatory reforms alone is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for this to happen, especially in the presence of underdeveloped private and financial sectors. Such reforms need to be embedded in a clearly articulated long-term transformative strategy supported by active industrial policies, effective implementation of a long-term public investment program and capacity building initiatives to enable structural change, as well as appropriate medium term incentives, including risk sharing and financial instruments for private sector mobilization. Special attention is needed in the design of effective and efficient social protection systems that would ensure the creation of jobs and the provision of quality social services open to all. Based again on the European experience, investing in social service provision is a major component and should be an integral component of a sustainable transformational agenda. Incentives embedded in such systems are crucial for formal employment, productivity growth, and fiscal sustainability. To be able to perform their mission, social protection systems should be designed and allowed to function as counter-cyclical systems that complement fiscal systems. Fiscal policy and social policy are not two separate areas of policy. They should be combined in one. The opposite, in fact, happened in crisis-stricken Europe. Fiscal retrenchment was based on severe cuts in social benefits at a time of rising unemployment and drastic cuts in disposable income. The financial gap became even greater as more and more employers ceased to pay social security contributions and employees moved into informal employment to avoid paying taxes. So the way the austerity measures were implemented increased informality and worsened the problem. A properly designed social protection system 
which does not create disincentives for formal employment or hiring, coupled with effective delivery mechanisms can protect the poor, promote growth, and facilitate structural change. In such cases, investments in social protection systems, including active employment policies, investments in education and training, social entrepreneurship, have sizable economic and social net returns that, if properly estimated, and we do not estimate them, unfortunately, could induce sizable public as well as private investments in social services. Efficient and effective social benefit provision to families, to the old, the poor, or vulnerable groups in our societies also have high net returns if one considers and measures appropriately the cost savings generated by well-run preventive health services, adequate nutrition for children and childcare facilities, or the provision of jobs under active labor market policy schemes. Social entrepreneurship, for example, which has been on the rise in many developed and developing countries, points not only to the existence of gaps in basic service provision, but also to the potential generation of profits from investments in such activities. Therefore, policy coherence across fiscal, industrial, and social policies is needed if employment creation, social inclusion, and fiscal sustainability is to be promoted. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, each country needs to set its own priorities and map its own course of action. For my own country, a transformational agenda would require efforts and investments to unleash innovation in both traditional sectors, such as the agri-food industry, tourism, energy, or cultural services, as well as move into new areas, including ICT, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, etc. It presupposes undertaking supportive structural reforms, such as regulatory reform to open up oligopolistic markets and reduce the cost of doing business, public sector and administrative reform to upgrade efficiency and quality of services, tax reform to expand the tax base, legal systems reforms to expedite core decisions, and redesigning our social protection system with the introduction of proper incentives. For Bangladesh? Well, for Bangladesh, you know better. But it would probably require diversing its economy further beyond textiles. Need to look ahead after this period. It probably would involve pursuing active industrial policies to gear the private sector towards new, these new areas. Undertaking governance and institutional reforms building public-private sector partnerships for development, and mobilizing development assistance, <coughs> trade, and domestic taxes to finance, first and foremost, infrastructure and other specific enablers. The challenges for our national governments and our political system are enormous. There is a danger, however, that they will not be addressed successfully if there is no change at the global level and at the political level. It is up to us to create a more enabling global environment by building partnerships for change, to join forces, to improve regulation and oversight of the financial system, to establish transparent and effective procedures for debt restructuring, to abolish tax havens and fight against tax evasion, to mobilize resources for development and use these resources as effectively as possible. In such an enabling environment, the pursuit of a sustainable and inclusive transformational agendas for the benefit of our societies will become promising. Thank you very much.